Wasn't that beautiful? Thank you so much, choir, for singing that, Don, for putting that together. Just beautiful. And good morning. Hope everyone is doing well on this uh, third Sunday in the Lenten season. I was reminded by our council representative that it's time for the council communicator today. So I was so glad, and she's already up here ready to go with enthusiasm. Heidi, thank you for being with us. Good morning. Um, I have a few updates from the council meeting last Thursday. The Easter egg hunt for this year will be held on Palm Sunday, April 10th from 1030 to 2. Um, there is a need for candy to fill the eggs for this event and see Liz if you have questions on that. Um, in technology, two new computers have been purchased to replace the outdated ones in the church office. An IT sticker support plan has been approved. No, an IT support plan has been approved. Each workstation will be getting a sticker on the monitor with the IT support protocol as well as a number for IT support. The lights on the electric sign at the front of the church were replaced by Tom Kilby. Thank you, Tom. There are 16 high school students and three adults signed up to attend the summer mission trip to Ohio. And on May 1st, there will be a debt retirement celebration. Bishop Timothy Smith will be a guest pastor for the worship service and a catered lunch will be provided um, following the service and a sign up sheet will be forthcoming. So thank you all. <laughs> And we, uh, we look forward to that service, to having the bishop with us on the first Sunday in May to preach and to, uh, uh, we'll also be wor welcoming back some clergy who have been here in the past. They will hopefully have a part in the service. So go ahead and mark your calendars. That's the first Sunday in May uh, coming up quicker than we think. Just some other things that happened today. We welcomed Miller Blaine Lamberth into membership at the early service through the sacrament of holy baptism. We had a good crowd of family and friends who were here for that baptism. Confirmation students will meet at the church at 1230 today. We're going to travel to Mount Pleasant for lunch and then to Mount Olive Lutheran Church for the session together. We'll be meeting with our high school and middle school youth this afternoon at 4.30. From 4.30 till 6, we have two families that have prepared a dinner for us, and we're going to be doing a service project together. And then please remember that our Kingdom Kids and 3 through 5 Alive will be meeting with March Madness. That will be next Sunday with Liz after the service at 12.30. Speaking of March Madness, uh, all the Carolina people were here early service and today praying prayers of thanksgiving, which we appreciate very much. I'm not going to say anything about this afternoon's game, but I know everyone will be supporting the Christian schools as they play this afternoon, you know, the church, the, the schools that have churches right in the middle of their campus. So I'm not calling any of those to mind, but just remember that it makes Jesus very happy when you pull for one of his colleges. So let's try to do that around 510 this afternoon. We were very sorry to hear yesterday of the passing of Martha Yant of our congregation. Martha had been under hospice care, had been struggling with dementia for some time, and Martha passed away yesterday morning about 6.30. Funeral services have not yet been determined, but the family was here at the early service, and uh, they request your prayers. We will certainly keep the congregation informed as we get closer to that service, probably looking at something for this coming weekend. We're glad that you're here today. We hope this service will be very meaningful for you. We invite you to stand together for the order of confession and forgiveness.
who walks with us and guides us in our pilgrimage. Amen. Let us make confession. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from you. We have not trusted your promises. We have ignored your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize you in our midst. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and turn us again to you. Teach us to follow in your ways. Assure us again of your love and help us to love our neighbor. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gathering hymn this morning is the wonderful hymn, Glorious Things of You Are Spoken.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Eternal God, your kingdom has broken into our troubled world through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Help us to hear your word and obey it and bring your saving love to fruition in our lives through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Good morning. This morning, the first reading is from Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 1 through 9. To those who have experienced long years in exile, the return to their homeland is a celebration of abundant life. God calls them into an everlasting covenant of love. Those who return to God will enjoy new life and forgiveness, because God's ways are not our ways. Now for the reading from Isaiah. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make you with an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall... You shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Word of God, word of life. The second lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 through 13. Paul uses images from Hebrew scriptures and prophecy to speak the truth of Jesus Christ. He is our rock, our water, our food, and our drink. Christ is the living sign of God's faithfulness. Now for the reading from 1 Corinthians. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors, our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as they did, as some of them did, and as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must, we must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain, as some of them did, and were destroy, destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. Word of God, word of life. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. Asked about current tragic events, Jesus turns a lesson about whether suffering is deserved into a hard call to obedience. He then tells a parable that holds out hope that the timeline for ultimate judgment will be tempered by patience. Now for the reading from St. Luke's Gospel. At that very time there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? 
No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. And then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, gardener see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? And he replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. I want you to know that I work really hard to not become political in the pulpit. It's, it's not always easy in this day and age, but I do have to say that I think I'm pretty successful here in not preaching politics, but today I have to begin my sermon with a story about the president, and that would, of course, be President Harry Truman. <clears throat> Harry Truman could never be elected today. He didn't have enough money. He was not able to finish college. He was not particularly successful in business, and he wasn't politically correct at all. When the music editor of the Washington Post criticized Truman's daughter, who was a singer. And let me just say that I use the word singer in the loosest possible sense. Bless her heart, she sang with her heart and her soul, but she was not always on key, and I'm very sensitive to that. But the music editor of the Washington Post was just critical of Margaret Truman in this editorial that he wrote. And Truman, who was a very devoted father of his daughter, blistered him in a letter to the editor. This is part of what he said. I have just read your lousy review of my daughter's concert. You must be a frustrated old man who wishes that you could have been a success in life some day, Truman said, I hope to meet you in person, and when that happens, you will need a new nose, and you will need a lot of beefsteak for your black eyes. That was Harry Truman, and he caught some grief for that. Now, my Harry Truman story, believe it or not, has more to do with this particular parable. It concerns a visit to the Rose Garden by the three chairwomen of the National Garden Club. The National Garden Club, these were blue-blooded ladies. The president was from Boston, the first vice president was from New York City, and the second vice president was from Philadelphia. President Truman grew up on a farm in Missouri, and he was absolutely thrilled that these three women were going to be in the Rose Garden for this reception. He was ecstatic about their visit. Truman loved growing flowers and vegetables, and immediately he cornered these three proper women and began to ask them questions about his favorite subject, which was manure. He wanted to know what kind of manure they used. He wanted to know what time of year they spread out their manure and what tools they used to ensure that the manure would be well worked into the soil. 
He was absolutely lost. He was caught up in this discussion. And you can imagine these three very prim and proper women, it just embarrassed them to death. And so they got Bess Truman, Harry's wife, off to the side and they said, Miss Truman, we are so very happy that your husband is enthusiastic about growing things. We love to grow things too, of course, but it is embarrassing to be talking with the leader of the free world about manure. Do you think you could get him to call it fertilizer? Now, Mrs. Truman knew her husband well. She smiled at the president of the Garden Club and she said, Honey, it took me 30 years to get him to call it manure. <laughs> now, the purpose of this story should present itself by the end of the sermon. And if it doesn't, then just remember that Harry Truman was a funny guy and sometimes it's okay to laugh during the Lenten season. In today's gospel reading, Jesus tells a wonderful story about the worst fig tree in history. Three years, three years and not one lousy fig. You know what that means, of course. That means no fig preserves. That means no figgy pudding at Christmas, not even a crumbly fig Newton for an afternoon snack, nothing, not a zilch. Fig trees in Judea were actually supposed to produce not just once during this season, but actually twice a year. But this tree has never borne fruit. So what are we going to do about it? Well, for the owner, it's an easy answer. You cut it down. Three years, come on, time's up. But the gardener pleads with the owner and says, Master, let it alone. In the Greek, the word for let it alone is aphetes, which also means forgive it. Master, forgive it. I'll dig around it. I'll throw in a little manure. The Greek word here is koprion, which means literally more probably the word that President Truman used for 30 years. Let me spread a little coprion on it and we'll see what happens. If there's no fruit, you can cut it down next year. Three years is a long time to wait especially when land is at a premium and you need to make some money off your crop, three years of waiting and still the servant begs for more time. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the harder it is for me to wait. I get frustrated waiting on folks. It's been years now since some of our members made their way to church. It's been years since some of our folks have made time for God. I see them in the community, right? I see them at the food line when I rush in for something and they rush into the beer and wine section where they, where they know a Lutheran pastor would never trod. Or I see them at some of our community sporting events, which I frequent on pretty regular occasions. They pull the hood of their sweatshirt up over their face and they hunker down so I won't recognize them. And if I finally corner them, I mean meet them, if I finally meet them, say downtown as I walk past the brewery, and there's no place for them to hide, they'll say to me, you know, Pastor, I was just thinking about you in the church the other day. I'm going to get by and see you all one of these next few Sundays. I've got a to-do list, 
and you are on it. I will see you sooner rather than later. And so I'm like a Kannapolis Cannonballer fan. I am positive about the future. I am hopeful for the coming spring. And I will wait. Do you ever think about how hard it must be for God to wait for us. Wait for us to put away a destructive habit. Wait for us to get our priorities straight in life. Wait for us to figure out what is really important in this life. It must be very difficult for God waiting and hoping, hoping and waiting for years and years and years and all the while, loving us beyond measure. So, sometimes God's tardiness, sometimes divine tardiness is a blessing. Jesus tells a story today about a tree that truth be told ought to be cut down. It is not doing what it was made to do, and yet the plea comes, Master, forgive it and give it some more time. We Lutherans call that grace, especially when we know that we haven't borne the good fruit that God expects from us, or when we haven't yet taken root or when we haven't bloomed into what we were created to be. In such times, God's patience, God's delay is a gift. What a relief there is still time. So is today's parable a story about judgment cut it down, or is it instead a story about grace? Give it more time. I suppose the answer to that question comes when we discern where we are on this journey. The truth of the matter is, and we confess this every Sunday, the truth is, there will be a judgment for all of us. An accounting, a day of reckoning, when fruitfulness will be examined and decisions will be made. Cut it down. And yet there is grace. There is still today, there is still Right now, there is still time. So here we are. How long do you think the master waited? Surely his patience couldn't be forever, could it? Did the manure do the trick? Did the tree ever produce fruit? Honestly, we don't know the answer. This is so typical of the parables that Jesus tells. Often there is no ending given. Maybe that's because God is still working out the ending. Working out the ending in each of us. And so by God's grace, you and I are given time to finish this story. So in the time that God gives us, are we willing to make time for God? The gospel, the good news for today, for right now, there is still time. Aren't you glad? I certainly am. Thanks be to God. Amen.
with the people of God in Christ now and in every time, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers now for the church, the world, and all who are in need. You're invited to kneel or be seated as able for the prayers of the church. Good and gracious God, we pray for the church around the world in all of its forms. We pray this day for pastors and deacons, for bishops, chaplains, and mission developers. We pray for congregation councils and committee chairs and all of our lay ministry leaders doing so many different things in this parish. We pray also for congregations that are contemplating difficult decisions about the future of their ministry. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for the health of this planet and for the well-being of its creatures, for lands that are impacted by droughts and at the risk of wildfires, for fig trees and vineyards that produce fruit for our nourishment and for our delight, for animal habitats that are threatened by the changes in our climate. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for all those who are called into positions of responsibility. We pray for judges, for attorneys, and for court administrators, all who are tasked with uncovering truth and delivering justice. We pray for our leaders around the world, and especially this day, pray for leaders in Eastern Europe that this warfare would soon come to an end and that your peace and your justice, O Lord, would reign. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for those who call upon you for mercy, for all who live in poverty and all who are hungry this day. We pray for any who feel tested beyond their strength. And we ask that you would give them a full measure of your presence. We pray for all who are hospitalized, those who are near death, for all who are in need of healing, and for those who are grieving this day. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Accept the prayers we bring, O oh God, on behalf of a world that is in need. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, amen. Let us stand together. Following his resurrection, the Lord Jesus breathed peace upon his disciples. We share in this peace of Christ in the church today. And so we say, the peace of the Lord be with you. Let us share God's peace with one another.
Let us stand together. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. Broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it for them to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered as one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray together now as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you have received the elements as you came into the sanctuary, or if you are communing from home, hear now these words. This is the body of Christ given for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. You may be seated.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Now receive this benediction. You are children of God, anointed with the oil of gladness and strengthened for the journey. Almighty God, motherly, majestic, and mighty, bless you this day and always. Amen. Our closing hymn is the wonderful spiritual Lead Me, Guide Me. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.